This week we're going to spend just a short amount of time um, doing a brief message on who we are and what we do as GCF. Um, and Grizzly Christian Fellowship is uh, a two-fold community seeking to engage the University of Montana with the treasure of Jesus. That's our mission statement. A two-fold community seeking to engage the University of Montana with the treasure of Jesus. And there's kind of three things going on in that mission statement. One is who are we? We're a two-fold community. The other is what we do. We engage campus. And the last thing is why we do it. And it has to do with the treasure of Jesus. And so um, who we are as a two-fold community, we're a campus community. We're an ASUM student group passionate about connecting students to other students. And the reality is that all students will connect at some point, somewhere, during their time here. You're going to find friends, you're going to find a social circle, you're going to find relationships, you're going to find ways to be entertained. And the question is going to be, is where are those places at? And who are these people? Because over these next four years, you're not just becoming who you're going to be when you walk across the graduation stage. You're actually going to be becoming the person you'll be largely for the rest of your life. And so not only do we want to think of who these people are and where these places are, but we want to think of how it will contribute to who you want to be and who you're going to be when that day comes. What are the relationships and the activities you're forming going to say about you as a person? And because of that, we want to be a campus community rooted here on campus. We want to be a place where you come and you meet people who are like you and people who are different from you, but people who genuinely care about you and want to grow with you. And that's why we do Bible studies on campus in the University Center. That's why we do a uh, uh, large group here. When, G when GCF first started uh, five years ago, it actually didn't meet on campus. It met off campus. And one of the first things we wanted to do when I took over was to bring it back to campus. And that's because we don't want your Christian community to be something that you leave campus to go and experience where there's your academic life and your social life, and then way across town is where Christianity matters. What we want to do is we want to bring Christianity here to the core of the University of Montana. And because of that, we want it to infiltrate your dorms and your meals and your evenings here as well. And actually, uh, for those of you who are familiar with history, when you look at the Great Awakenings, these revivals that even... Uh, uh, public school history courses talk about in America, they didn't start in a church. They actually started on college campuses. And as Christians at universities began to share the gospel with one another and pray and read the Bible, there is this great conversion, this great revival which happened, which actually kind of restructured much of America. And so we talk about the gospel being rooted at the University of Montana. It's not just this optimistic pipe dream. But it's something that we know God has done in the past and will do. But the reality is, is even compared to Montana State University, there's really a limited Christian presence here at the University of Montana. But that means there are plenty of opportunities for us to make a difference. And so we want to be a campus community investing here, not being worried about what people think here or what people are going to say, but really seeing that this is a place where God has people who he's going to save and we want to be a part of that. We want to have a, 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 a campus community, but we're also part of a local church community. And that's a twofold aspect. Grizzly Christian Fellowship is not a church, but we're part of one. We um, aren't a church in and of ourselves because a church made up of only college students would be showing up just right now. Um, and also, I knew of an organization that planted in downtown Missoula that only attracted college students. Um, it was just the only people who were interested in it, apparently. And they had a weekly offering of like $6.07. Um, so apart from not being a great financial model for a church, it's also not a great theological model for the church. Because Jesus didn't just save people who are like you. Jesus saved people from all age groups and all ethnicities and making an eclectic church. Jesus died for the whole assembly. And actually in Greek, the word church just means the assembly. And so there's no parameters on the churches, only this college age group or only this parent and young adult age group. The church is for Christians to gather and that eclectic nature is what makes up the church. And so as we gather weekly at Sovereign Hope Church, what we're doing is we're actually exposing ourselves to the greater reality of God's salvation. We're seeing that the gospel is so big that it's not just attractive to people who are like you. It's not just attractive to people with your own problems or people from your, a similar background. The gospel is cross-cultural. It crosses age barriers and language barriers. And we want our local churches to look more like God's global church. 
It's easy to relate to people like you and me, but it's harder sometimes to relate to 60-year-old widows. But that's what the church has. It has people from different age ranges and different life brackets. But when we gather as God's church, we actually not only are seeing God's salvation being enacted, but we're actually helping each other be better Christians. The Bible uses this analogy of a body where we make up for their weaknesses with our strengths and their strengths make up for our weaknesses. And I've seen this even with some of my own people I went to school with here um, is they went to campus communities like GCF or like crew or InterVarsity and they didn't go to a, a local church. And they, they, they thought this campus community was their local church. The problem was, is when they left school, they walked into a church building for the first time and they see people who aren't like them. And they're like, I don't know how to talk to you. I know it's gonna take effort, I know it's gonna take time, and I don't wanna do that, so I'm gonna peace out. And so part of the reason we want to be part of a local church is because we, want, we, we know that God hasn't just called Christians to gather together as college students for four years. He's called you to participate in the church for the rest of your life so that you can be encouraged and led in worship with the people of God. And so we want to practice that as a church. And so that's why we gather. By combining campus and church, we expand uh, the area of care. We expand exposure to God's people. And we participate in the church the way God intended it to be used. And so what do we do? We seek to engage the University of Montana. That's a broad term. So what does that mean? If we want to create a community, the point is we have to start making a community at some point. And we do that through relationships. Grizzly Christian Fellowship is, uh, is driven by relational discipleship. That means that we're not going to put on huge events hoping that we're going to get a few people who stick around. It means that we really want to invest in you. We want to know you. We want to get to, to know you. We want to hear your story. We want to help walk through the gospel with you. We want to process problems biblically with you. And that means we're not just interested in sharing the gospel. We're interested in sharing the gospel with you because the gospel is for people. The gospel saves a large number of people because Jesus is powerful and Jesus is great and Jesus is strong. But the reality is, is he's saving individuals and we're concerned about those individuals. That means that we as GCF, we can grow to 10 times the size of this room and we could still be doing the ministry of the church poorly because if those people those individuals aren't treasuring the gospel and growing in worship. We're not doing what we're called to do as Christians. And so we want to develop relationships which are obsessed with the reality of Jesus and the gospel of salvation. That means that the events that we, we do do, um, like the fall retreat we talk about and the two retreats we do later in the spring, they're really designed to facilitate and strengthen those discipleship relationships. And because we want to engage campus, we're also dedicated to training up students. Because here I stand as the director of GCF, and I could stand here and preach to whoever shows up on a Thursday night, but the reality is I don't sit in your classes. I don't eat at the food zoo. I'm not up at three in the morning hunting Pokemon on the Oval, but you are. And that's why we want to make sure that you're not just a casual participant. We want to make sure that you are someone who's equipped to care and to give away the gospel to your roommates and your friends. You see, outside of sharing the gospel, we want to see gospel growth. We don't want to just see people believe the gospel and check some box for salvation and go their separate way and leave it compartmentalized in a different aspect of their life. We want to see people grow in their understanding of it, grow in their ability to communicate it. And that's because we want GCF to be your ministry. Ephesians 4.12 says that the, God has given gifts to the church for the purpose of equipping the saints for the work of ministry. That means when you consider your own life right now, if you, if you consider yourself a Christian, but you're not actively ministering to people around you, you're not doing fully what Christ came to, to equip you to do. You might be saved, but you're not quite living as Christianly as the Bible has called us to live. And it's an ominous task to think about you doing ministry. But we want to help you do that. We want to train you to understand the gospel so well that like the newest movie you saw that captivated you, you can't help but tell other people about it. We want to help you read and understand your Bible so you can read and understand the Bible with people who are around you and non-Christians. One of the primary ways we do discipleship is actually just meeting students on campus and saying, hey, do you want to read the Bible with me? 
Because when we learn how to read the Bible rightly, we see Christ and we see salvation in all of Scripture. We want you to have such a stunning picture of the gospel that you paint an attractive story of salvation because it's so real in your own life. And the reality is, as I mentioned, Grizzly Christian Fellowship is only five years old. And to be honest, we've had really large years and we've had really small years. And we're coming off of our smallest year we've ever had. And that's largely due in part to a lack of the students leading students. We've never had a culture of students who come here and then go and want to invest in other students. It's been kind of consumeristic. Part of that has been how we've run our ministry. We've been trying to figure out how to do this well. But we're convicted that in order for this to be something which bears fruit 20 years down the road, we need to create a culture of not just showing up on Thursdays, but of people who want to share the gospel with other people. And so we've done two things to help supplement that. Two things that are big components of what we do here at GCF. Outside of large groups and Bible studies and casual discipleship, these are two primary things you'll hear a lot about over a year. The first is summer training project, which we'll hear more about at fall retreat. Um, we have some people who are there. They can't raise their hand right now because answers to the people bingo questions later. Um, but summer training project is a three-month training program where you get to spend life in a Christian community uh, and you're just being trained on how you yourself love the gospel and how you can give that away to others. And it's really a great way we want to raise leaders here at GCF. The second is the internship. We have Stephen this year who's an old weird intern. Um, but typically we want people to see uh, their their term with GCF going four plus one. Four years of being involved with GCF um, and even discipling people inside of that. But a lot of times when people graduate, they don't have something lined up right away, and, but they love college ministry. Because they've been doing it as juniors and seniors, they really have gained a passion not only for discipling students, but for discipling students here at the university. And to help with that one year and to encourage um, ministry, we do a one-year internship with students to stay one year afterwards and invest and pour in to GCF and its students. We want students to see their time at the University of Montana as a time to labor in the gospel. You see, in Acts 17, Peter says that um, God has determined the places in which you will live and the size of your dwelling so that men might find their way to God. That means that you are here at the University of Montana, living in whatever cubicle you're in around campus for the specific purpose of helping people find God. That's why the Lord has put you here. And some people will say, well, that's not why I'm here. I'm here to get a degree. I'm here to have fun. I'm here to get credentials for a job that I want. Why does Jesus have to do uh, something with all of my life when I just give him the salvation part of my life? What does Jesus have to do with my college career? And that's where why we do what we do is important. We do this because Jesus is the greatest treasure the world will ever know. You see, and we are often so unaware or unconcerned about our life and the gospel because we're value blind. We don't know what true value is. And actually, one thing you'll realize four years, three years, two years from now, when you graduate college, you'll realize the most influential thing you will have learned isn't stoichiometry or accounting. The most interesting and relevant thing you'll learn is what your heart values. When you look back at your time at a university, you will see what your priorities are. You will see what your treasure is, and you will see what you value most above everything else. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 21, that where your treasure is, there your heart is will be also. And so as we're desiring, as we're doing, as we're getting plugged in, as we're engaging, as we're doing things with our free time, you're doing more than just living. You're establishing a pattern of worship based on what you think is valuable. And that word valuable means two things. One, it means that something is useful. One, it means that something is esteemable. And so we say things are valuable, which have a lot of utility, like a car, you can have the trashiest beater Subaru in all of Missoula, yet you have a great Missoula value because you're driving a Subaru that has four-wheel drive and it gets you everywhere. It's valuable in Missoula. You could also have a gold ring, which is rare and limited and small, but because it's to be esteemed and because it's beautiful, it has value. 
You see, in college, we go on a desperate pursuit to find valuable treasure. And more than just wanting something that is one of those, we want both. We want something which is beautiful and helpful, something which, which is lovely and also satisfying. And each year, students flood campuses across the country, starting on a four-year crash course in treasure hunting. We go and turn to relationships and sex to bring value to our lives. We throw our social lives away into the vat of our degree program, trying to get some sort of prestige or honor from a title that will be on a piece of paper. We go ahead and we obsess over the product of their study here, of what it's going to achieve in terms of a job, which is going to grant them their dream home and their dream spot to live in security and comfort. We run full blast into fun, not wanting to waste four years on stoic study, but instead living life to the fullest here in the mountains of Montana. People will even invest in things which seem more admirable, like philanthropy or social studies or service. And as we try to find value and worth in all these things, I can tell you that none of them will find ultimate utility and value because none of those things ultimately address who we are as human. They don't lastingly satisfy and they're not lastingly useful because they're just symptoms of an otherwise embedded problem. You see, God made humanity perfect and place them in a position of extreme value. He created Adam and he created Eve, male and female, and he put them in this garden where there was no hurt and there was no pain and there was no suffering and there was no final exams. It was just perfection. And that perfection didn't come from the absence of any of those things. That perfection came from the presence of something, namely God. And not only was God in this garden, but God had a perfect relationship with Adam and Eve. And when that perfect relationship of a holy and pure and good God was there, none of the things that burden us, none of the things that make us dissatisfied could live there. God the creator knew what was best for his people and he held nothing back from them. And Adam and Eve looked at this and they doubted God's goodness. They looked at all the perfection that God had provided them, all of the protection that God had afforded them, and they said, Maybe we could be God. Maybe we could do better. Maybe we know better. And they sinned. They chose instead to trust their truths rather than God's truth. And they disobeyed. That's all it was. Simple disobedience. But in that act of sin, it wasn't a mere trespass or a misstep. They waged an active rebellion against the God who created them to know and worship him. And as, and as soon as they disobeyed, perfection as they knew it was fractured. Not because death came, not because the trees started getting worms and the fruit started dying and Adam started getting old. Death came because they severed the relationship between God and man. Romans 5.12 says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. And so when we look at the story in Adam and Eve, when Adam sinned, though we weren't even yet alive, we sinned. When Adam died, though you weren't even a twinkle in your parents' eyes, you died. You see, the wages of our rebellion in the garden was death because we already openly rejected life. We had it and we said it wasn't enough. We deserve the wrath of God who made us because we looked at him and we said, we can do better. You don't know what's best for me. And that's the cradle in which we're born. We live in this shattered world where perfection is a pipe dream and it doesn't really exist. We live in a world where we, we never like to say we're naturally a sinner, but once you become a parent or if you babysit, you see sin doesn't need to be taught. I don't need to teach my kids to be selfish. I didn't teach my four-year-old son to be violent. These things are naturally in our hearts already because our hearts are dead and this is the world we inherited. This is the world where hurt lives, a broken world, one reeling from the side effects of sin with cancer, with war, with racism, and with hate. And because we're broken, we wrestle to find true value in anything. We search for answers to the problem in everything, but don't you find it interesting that those who have everything seem to point to the problem we had in the first place? Have you ever read the obituary of a celebrity? 
It's the celebrities who have everything, who have the most depressing obituaries. It's the tombstone of the king, which portrays our true emptiness. I watched a documentary on Ian Fleming, the, the man who wrote James Bond, and the documentary was just called Ian Fleming, The Man Who Was Bond. And they say that because so much of the fanfare and the luxuries that James Bond lives, the life of women and riches and fast cars, that was Ian Fleming's life. And not only did he live that, but as his books and his movies got more and more popular, he got more wealth, more popularity, more things that the world said you needed. And I remember this specific scene in the, in the documentary where they're describing this boy who came up to Ian Fleming. And here's the superstar who has everything, all the women, all the cars, all the money, all the fame. He says, what is your life like? And Ian Fleming looked at that boy. He said, ashes, dear boy. Ashes. You see, we don't have to look far to realize that those who have everything are often the people who realize that everything doesn't satisfy us. And this is the rat race we're born, born into. Our lives are desperate flails, attempting to find something out of nothing, attempting to be filled by everything, not realizing that broken hot pots hold nothing. We look for life in anything, not realizing that dead bodies can't contain a heartbeat. And this is where you might say, well, here's the typical pastor saying I'm a sinner. And it's true. But we emphasize the state of the sinner not to shame or solidify your position, but instead we speak truth, hoping to hold a spotlight to God's solution. Because we all start at sinner. We all start at broken. We all start at dead. But the good news of the gospel, the gospel distinction we're going to spend four weeks looking at, is that God didn't abandon us. When we sinned on that day in the garden where we weren't even present, God promised to make things right. He promised to send someone to step on the head of the serpent which deceived us. And he sent his own son, Jesus Christ, in the flesh. He sent him to live the life that Adam couldn't live. A life where Jesus obeyed perfectly, trusted splendidly, and lived ultimately. And out of all the people who ever lived on the earth, not even your grandma was, an, was as innocent as Jesus was. He was the only person who could actually say, this isn't fair, and it was true. He was the only person where there was no need for retribution. He didn't wrong anyone. He didn't sin against anyone. There was no slight word, no errant message, no fist clenched in anger. He was the only innocent person. But he died for the guilty because the guilty demanded his blood. And when Jesus died on the cross, it wasn't this cosmic mess up that God in heaven looked down upon. He said, how am I going to redeem this? He died because he offered up willingly his perfect life to make atonement for the sins of those who lived in imperfection. As his body was torn on the cross, it was torn so that those who were once separated from God could be united to him. The relationships which were shattered in the garden were restored on the cross and where Adam lived to bring death, Jesus died to bring life. Romans 5.17 says, For if because one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ. And so Jesus came and he died for us. And he died for us not because we asked, because dead men don't ask. He didn't die for us because he saw our potential, because dead men don't have potential. He didn't even die for us because we started to overcome evil with good. Romans 5, 8 says, But God showed his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, the value of Jesus isn't splendorous. I don't know if that's even a word. Is that a word? You, no? Splendiferous? Splendid? That works. Isn't splendid because we discovered something wonderful. Jesus is valuable, not because we found him, but because he found us and he laid down his life to fix our broken life. And because Jesus rose from the dead in newness of life, we too have newness of life. And in that moment, your perspective on college changes. In that moment, when you understand the new life you have in Jesus, where you were once dead, Paul says, uh, you were dead following the prince of the power of the air and the principalities of this world, and you were like the rest of mankind, children of disobedience. 
When that was you and Jesus made you alive, you don't get a new outlook on education and that's it. You get a new outlook on your breath and your life and your pulse. And this is where we see a subtle but transformative shift. In Colossians, Paul says this, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. You see, the greatest utility, the greatest value, is that which endures into eternity. And to do work here, to have fun, to benefit society, to get good grades, to have a nice job, to take care of people, that's good and that's noble. But to do the same work here which endures into eternity is a greater value to humanity. The greatest utility you have for your fellow man is the life-giving, sin-killing, Christ-exalting power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we understand that, calling you to give up four years of your life to work on who you're going to be, but also to work on God's glorious plan for salvation isn't a burden and it isn't abstract because you've begun to see a different value in the one who saved you. A value which Paul talks about in Philippians 3, verses 7 through 8, where he says this, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. You see, we do this ministry in one reason because we want you to live. We want you to have life. But contrary to what you might hear about Christianity and about religion, it goes so much further than that. We do this ministry and we proclaim Christ and we study the Bible and we engage others because we're after your joy. Because no one who's found a great value is dead in their affection for it. But when we see what Christ has done in our life, we see the greatest joy in our life. Ecclesiastes 5.20, my favorite verse in the whole Bible, written by a guy named Solomon. Solomon is this king who God promised. He said, so if any of you want a promise in the Bible, this is probably a promise you want. Solomon, I'm going to make you the richest, wisest, most powerful human to have ever lived. It's pretty good odds. Great opportunity for success. And Solomon says this, Starting in, in, in Ecclesiastes 5.19. So to those to whom God has given power and wealth and the ability to, re, to enjoy them, who's given toil. And he goes on to say this in 5.20. It says that man will not much remember the days of his life, for God will keep him occupied with joy in his heart. Now I want you to listen to that verse. Solomon, the man who had everything, he says, to the one whom God has given money and wealth and power and the ability to enjoy them. The one who has, he, he, Solomon had block parties of drunkenness and sexuality that went on for weeks. And he says, when you look back at your life, you will not much remember the days of it. You won't remember the prestige you had in class. You won't remember the girlfriends you had. You won't remember the dinners you had. You won't remember the mountain peaks you climbed. You won't look back at the things you did and say, that was my joy. You will look back and look at the one who occupied your heart and you will say, that was where my joy was. You see, the beauty of Solomon's wisdom is that it stretches past circumstances. It includes those who have everything and it includes those who have nothing. It includes those who are in here and it includes those who are out there that the greatest joy you will have in your life comes from a God who takes hold of your heart. So my question is, your first week of campus, if you want joy, if you want value, if you want eternal satisfaction, it's not going to come in the consumption of the world. It's not going to come what realistically this whole university is set up to pitch to you. It's going to come from the God who kicks down the door of sin through the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit who enlivens our heart to know and see the value 
of Jesus Christ. You see, at GCF, we don't want to be, I'm assuming the majority of people in here have backgrounds in Christianity, and that's great. And that's where we start out every year. But I don't want this to be a group for people who are raised in the church. I want this to be a group where people who don't know Jesus, people who are dead in their sin, come to see the salvation of Jesus on this campus this year. And that's the thrust of our ministry. The university might be after student retention, but we're after God's salvation. And we do it because we trust that God is good. And so at GCF, in all we do, we want to call you to repent from your sins and believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And together with your classmates and your leaders to live a life of joy, following and serving King Jesus. As Jesus says in Matthew 13, verse 45 and 46, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. We're asking you to sell all that you have, but we're doing it so that you can have the treasure of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for the gospel which saves us. And Lord, as we sit here, um, we want two things to happen. One, we want you to convict us in such a way where we see with new eyes the beauty and treasure of Jesus. We want that to compel us in our community and in our, our, our entertainment and in our devotions and in our way we go to church and the way we listen to sermons. But Lord, we want to pray right now that through these people, not through any event, not through any magical speaker, we're going to fly in for a retreat, not through any flyers, not through any welcome feast. We pray that through these individuals in this room, the gospel will go forth on this campus. We pray that in 50 years, we will be meeting in Uri Lecture Hall, filling a 350-seat room, because starting today, we begin to leave a legacy of salvation at the University of Montana. Lord, we pray this not because we want to be made much of, but because we want to make much of you. And God is most glorified when we are in the joy and satisfaction he brings us, proclaiming and reaching out to those who are lost with the wonderful treasure of Jesus Christ. We give you the rest of this night. We give you our worship and our partaking of some wonderful Big Dipper ice cream. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.